and commend it to the House. Mr. Speaker. The Honourable David Parker. Uh, can I add my thanks to uh, Kennedy Graham uh, and to the philanthropists who uh, sponsored the report. They were very generous. They were more generous than they initially realised they were going to have to be, because <laughs> there's a bit more work in this than was realised. <laughs> Sir, um, uh, uh, if we in New Zealand uh, can't sustain our environment, which country in the world can? I find that a very uncomfortable question. Uh, because it effectively says that if New Zealand doesn't, the world won't, and it's actually not a very nice future for the world or for our children. So we know that uh, the planet's already over halfway to two degrees warming. Uh, we know that if we're to meet our carbon budget uh, um, and stay below two degrees, we've actually got to stop the remaining one-thirds of that, or more than the remaining one-thirds of that budget being released. And at current trends, they'll all be out there in the atmosphere in the next 15 to 20 years. We're running out of time. Sir, so we've got um, the Arctic soon to be ice-free in summer, in the centre of the Arctic particularly. We've got record temperatures being recorded annually, or semi-annually. Uh, we've got glaciers in Greenland, New Zealand, Antarctica all melting. Uh, We've got whole Pacific Island nations uh, sinking under the rising sea. Uh, we seem to be able to, as a world, uh, cater with that because they're small populations, despite the fact that we're losing entire cultures. Um, I remember one of the most frightening things I discovered, and other people will probably knew this when I first discovered it some years ago, a meteor rise, a meter rise in, in sea level means 30 million Bangladeshi people have to move. Where do they go? Where do they go? So, sir, I, 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 um, come, I come back to the, one of the propositions that I thought I heard the minister saying, which was effectively saying we have to choose between a clean environment or a strong economy. Right. I reject that dichotomy. We can have both. Sir, um, as others have said, I was privileged to be climate change and energy minister under Helen Clark's Labour-led government. And I came to that conclusion that I've earlier suggested, that if New Zealand couldn't overcome our environmental problems, including our contribution to climate change and gases, there was no hope the world would. I thought that was an incredibly depressing future, and therefore I preferred the framing that we can, and we can, and that we should therefore be a beacon of hope rather than another source of despair. Sir, the Vivid report at one level doesn't actually tell us much more about how we can do it. We've always known what are the sources of emission and the sources of emission reduction. But it does articulate a number of scenarios which would reduce New Zealand's emissions. One of the points my colleague made, uh, Dr Megan Wood, is whichever scenario you have, you need a carbon budgeting agency to help you lead you towards there, partly because it depoliticises the route there. Sir, um, as to the hope of getting there, I know of no environmental problem to which there isn't a solution. Sorry. There is none. Now, um, the solution may involve substituting a product, and it might cost a little bit more. Um, but the new practice only costs more if you're not properly pricing or properly calculating or valuing the environmental costs that you're avoiding. When you boil down environmental policy to get to those ends, there's only three choices. Education, regulation, and price. We need all of them. Education doesn't get you there. When the, fight, when the uh, economic or the profit um, motivation of private enterprise enables one person to compete against someone who's doing it more expensively but cleaner, then the, you, t you, you undermine the clean one unless you have a regulation or price which stops them being taken out of the market by someone who's willing to cut that environmental corner. So we need all three. In respect of uh, the emissions uh, profile of New Zealand, it's essentially half agriculture and half energy. The half in energy splits roughly one third into transport, electricity and industrial processes and industrial heat being the final third of that. Electricity, I think, is under control. Uh, uh, and you know, I know National claims credit for that. I put a bit of work into that myself, um, but I won't get into that political debate. Um, we actually have to double, and, and my predecessors did too, um, electricity um, production has to double from here, and it has to be clean in order for us to overcome our transport uh, challenge. But we can and we will. The answer to that lies in regulation, not price. 
You know, uh, good ideas have many parents, but it annoys me that some of the ideas that come from this side are left as orphan children and the National Party won't pick them up. It has been clear for years that we need a regulatory standard to drive the adoption of low emission vehicles, including electric vehicles. That's all you need is a ceiling on the, or, or an allocation of so many grams per 100 kilometres of travel that descends quite steeply and that will drive the adoption of electric vehicles into the fleet and you don't need any other instrument at all. It's really simple. This government tinkers around the edges with stupid uh, rules about like giving people a free pass when it comes to their um, contributing to the cost of roads. That's the wrong approach. We need a regulation. In respect of land, sir, we need a price on carbon in agriculture. The uh, Vivid report makes this clear at page 17 and says that the underlying economics need uh, the agricultural sector to see a price because that goes to the economics of different land use. It is basic economics. The Treasurer have said it. It's why the old carbon tax was dumped. Everyone knows it's true. And to hear the National Party still put their head in the sand and say it's wrong is, is, is galling, sir. It was put this way by New Zealand Oil and Gas, sir, recently. The current government has tried to put this beyond the purview of their reviews that they have of the ETS, notwithstanding their see no evil, hear no evil approach. New Zealand Oil and Gas said this in 2016. New Zealand's major source of energy emissions are energy transport and agriculture, and an attempt is meet, made to meet all of New Zealand's emission reductions from energy and transport, and biological emissions from the agriculture sector continue to be excluded, then the schemes, that's the ETS, will create economic distortions and unfairness and fail to meet at its objectives. These flaws will become more pronounced as the economic of impact of the scheme increases. Sir, the logic is irrefutable, and anyone in this House who denies that is wrong. It is simple. You can have 90 per cent or even 100 per cent free allocation for background emissions in agriculture, but if you price their marginal increase in emission or reward them for their decrease, you will have the behavioural change and you will drive the land use change that's necessary. Sir, I haven't got much uh, more time, so I'm going to concentrate on what I think is the key recommendation here. Of the three, of the four scenarios, the three scenarios that um, mentioned in the report, for me, the standout one is Innovative 2050. I'm not scared of it. I think there is real opportunity for us to be wealthier as, a cons as well as cleaner. So land use change towards higher value uh, uses of land, higher value than dairying, are the key to reducing our agricultural emissions. We, those that were at the Royal Society Forum last night would have seen some amazing presentations of how we've now got the sensor technology. We've got the um, developing robotics. Um, we've got precision agricultural techniques. Now, these are coming together, uh, together with ubiquitous mobile uh, uh, technology, which is also helping. These are coming together to enable a move of far more of our land into horticulture and crop production, which is a higher value use, a higher value land use with a lower environmental impact. Uh, they still some nitrate challenges. Uh, they can be overcome through precision agriculture, but there's no ruminant emissions from it. That is the key, sir, and it's an exciting future for New Zealand. It's one that's more profitable. There's the technology jobs as well. Some of the technology we've shown last night of robotic um, sensing of grapes uh, and some of the information we had about the robotic apple picking that's already happening in the United States and will be coming to New Zealand in the next little years just shows what a, an amazing future that we have as a country if we just push towards it. We put a huge impediment in the way of that land use change by not letting or not making agriculture take responsibility for their emissions. They're going up. They will go down. Not only that, water quality will improve. We would have avoided the deforestation that sadly happened um, since uh, this government took over in the, in the, um, in the northern forest area, sir, around Taupo, etc. Sir, there is a solution here. If we are elected, uh, Agriculture will be coming into the ETS very fast. We've always said it should. 
We have always said their free allocation should start at 90 per cent of 2005 emissions. We have not resiled from that. That is a key step which will drive so much other change. Sir, I do not have any more time other than, again, to, thank, uh, to express my thanks to all members from uh, various parties who have supported us getting this far through the Vivid Report. Mr Speaker. James Shaw. Mr. Speaker, as